So we are live now, Mohsen, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our uh, e seminar series on translational biomedical engineering uh, with Professor Boudot. Uh, today, uh, before starting her presentation, uh, I actually go through some, uh, again, some housekeeping notes. Uh, this uh, presentation will be recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. And if you have any question, please use the Q&A box on the bottom of the page. And, and also, uh, there's a poll box uh, on the bottom of the, the page that you can take the poll and uh, help us to improve the, 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 the e-seminar series. And uh, for the next uh, week, we have Professor most in, uh, yeah, uh, we have Professor uh, Sheikh Amir Sheikhi from Penn State University from the Department of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering that he will talk about his uh, research and also his efforts to, to do some translational research. And if you have any question, you can always ask Mohsen and me uh, as the organizers and, uh, and also to get the most updated information of, about the upcoming seminars, just uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, hashtag trans, uh, translational BME. And uh, by that, I would like also to thank uh, Montreal Institute, uh, Montreal Transmet Tech Institute for supporting us uh, from the beginning of this E series. And by that, uh, I go to uh, Caroline's, uh, Professor Bodu's uh, uh, biography. Uh, Full Professor of Engineering Physics and Rookie Entrepreneur, Professor Boudou, obtained her PhD from the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program in the United States. She then completed a postdoc fellowship at Ecole Polytechnique in France before starting her laboratory in 2007 at Polytechnique Montreal in Canada. Her research topics range from laser tissue interactions to novel instruments for biomedical imaging. Uh, with a colleague and a strategic uh, investors, she later founded Caster Optics, a spin-off company commercializing a new line of double uh, clad fibers uh, couplers. Professor Bodos uh, also uh, has a book, has a textbook uh, that covers a comprehensive range of topics in biomedical optics and biophoton uh, biophotonics that uh, is uh, now taught in, in different schools and uh, by herself. And by that, I want to invite Professor Bodos to, uh, to share her screen and start her presentation, please. Let's see. Is this working properly? Yes, perfect, perfect, thank you. Perfect. So you see my slide. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, first, for setting up this translational biomedical engineering e-seminar series, I think, um, desperately needed in, in these times of COVID. So, and I'm absolutely proud to be, to be part of this seminar and thrilled to present to you today. We're going to talk about not just optical fibers, but optical fibers for biomedical applications. Um, talk about innovations from the lab to the clinics, to the market, and back. So how we uh, started as, as uh, how I started as, a, as an engineering physics student, uh, developing new techniques for the clinical applications, and then wonder how we can look at every individual component, make it better, sometimes uh, patenting it and commercializing it, and then hear about what the industry is saying about our products and go back to the drawing board and how essentially the, um, the experience in the clinics and in the company is feeding my research. So I need to start with a, a slide on conflict of interest. Uh, I have, uh, as, as was said in the introduction, a lab at Polytechnic Montreal. I, I, I tend to see myself as a rookie professor, but uh, Human reminds me that I've been there since 2007, so it's been quite quite a, a while now. And in, in 2013, we started Castor Optics. So Castor is an R&D firm and also manufacturing here in Mont Montréal in Ville Saint Laurent, and we're strategic partners with a distributor, worldwide distributor, Thor Labs. 
essentially how do I split my time, but most importantly, how do I split ideas? If ideas lead to a publication, it typically is uh, performed at Polytechnic, carried through at Polytechnic Montreal. If it's a Me Too product, so for example, a fiber optics, a special fiber optics, but at a different wavelength that is essentially a copy of a previous publication, the research and development will be done at Castor. But it turns out that now Castor is its own lab, its own entity, it creates its own IP and own patents. So now the separation is, is much easier to do than it was in, in the early days. But we tend to have a clear separation between the two. And given my attention span of about 17 seconds, it works quite nicely. So um, I, I'm, um, uh, I, I, I like to travel now with COVID, of course, I, I'm a little more uh, stay at home person, but I did my PhD in Massachusetts, then went to Polytechnique Paris to work on nonlinear microscopy, uh, they call Polytechnique. Uh, my, my PhD was on biomedical optics. So optical coherence tomography, confocal microscopy. And then I started my lab in Montreal and I also took a sabbatical to finish my first textbook. And I just got, I, I got completely hooked to writing textbooks. So now I'm, I'm writing my fourth textbook as we speak. My, um, there are several activities in my lab and I'm not gonna go in details about every one of them, but um, because of my, my um, Postdoctoral years, I tend to have nonlinear microscopy as a fun place in my heart. So we are equipped to do rapid multiplexed nonlinear microscopy at the school. Uh, I'm a full researcher at Centre de Recherche de Saint Justine, uh, where we do our animal imaging. I was uh, very much involved uh, with Mass Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary back in Boston, where we do clinical and preclinical imaging, and as part of my work within Polytechnique and at Castor, we do instrument development. So th those are the axes. And, you know, the, depending on the interest of the student, if it's hardcore physics versus engineering physics versus biomedical engineering, or even some clinical fellow, I can, um, there's one axis of, uh, in my group uh, where they can thrive. So we've done some work on nonlinear microscopy where we essentially exploited properties of light, uh, especially ultra-fast um, uh, pulses, to be able to excite simultaneously two different fluorophores with very high uh, speed, switching speed between the two, such that, that we could uh, take um, 4D uh, video, so 3D over time of a developing Drosophila embryo here with uh, EGFP in the nucleus, and natural autofluorescence in the yolk. And so what you see are individual cell um, just migrating to the center and starting to, to, for, to form the first invagination of the embryo becoming an organism. And what you see on the, um, on the right are the pulse shaping that we did to obtain this. So this is one axis of my lab, just broadly speaking, but we also work on technology that are a little more mature and go to the clinic. So this is uh, Dr. Hartnick at Mass and Air and you see Fuzi Buja, my first PhD student who is testing essentially his OTT system in the clinic. So in a system that he built entirely uh, to be able to uh, look at different areas. So some of my students are working in Montreal on thyroid and parathyroid, but we are with Dr. Hartnick, we're looking at vocal folds. So everything essentially had a neck. This is, these are activities that we carry through. But we don't just focus on technologies that are ready to make the switch to go to the clinic to, to be translated. We also work on designing pieces that were, are going to be part of the next generation of those systems. And so with Professor Nicolas Godbout at Laboratoire des Fibres Optiques, we come up with new fiber optics components. Fiber optics allow you to bring light from a laser inside a patient and carry and, and collect the light back to form an image or send a higher power uh, laser in to do therapy. And we also uh, do custom lenses so we can do, um, we have a, a system to make custom optical components to improve the quality of imaging, to remove dispersion and so on and so forth. So back to the basics, uh, back to my favorite topic, my, my, my PhD thesis topic. Uh, um, let's start with one example where uh, um, 
we started with an idea to very rapidly to go to the clinics, learn from the clinics, and then come back and say, what can we improve on? So an idea here was to perform um, rapid imaging within uh, the body using the smallest instrument. And if you're trying to do imaging, some of the, uh, the challenges that you will see is how can you miniaturize the scanner at the tip of your instrument? A fiber optics is very small. It's the size of my hair. So that essentially is the smallest instrument you can have. But how do you make the tip? How do you make the optics on the tip? And how do you have a scanner on the tip to be able to get a 2D read, a 3D image? And spectrally encoded imaging was one of the tricks that we played. We essentially said, we started by dreaming and said, what if we had a laser that were was changing in color very rapidly in time, and at the tip of the, the, the fiber optics, we put a prism. If we change in time from Newton's experiment, then you notice that if we put in a prism, the prism will change the location of the light. And if you have a scanning laser in terms of wavelength, you essentially have a scanning onto your, uh, your sample. Um, of course, this is the image. Uh, the, the laser did not exist and the prism does not deviate enough. So we, we went with a diffraction grading. This is what's displayed here. And this is where we started. So my first contribution was designing the laser that changes rapidly in, in, uh, in time. So we, we have now have lasers that can uh, change 100,000 times per second. So we can do um, imaging that is very rapid. But we also looked at the fiber optics. The fiber optics, as I said, is what brings the laser, the light inside the body. So you go from the laser, you, you bring the light through the body, and then light will be reflected by or backscattered by your sample and collected by the fiber. And one of the problems that we had was that in order to preserve all the properties from the laser, light could only be carried by a single mode core. So a part of the fiber optics that is very, very, very small. When it hits the tissue, the tissue, and when I say tissue, I mean any organs. It can be the esophagus, the stomach, any, any type of human material. It's not like a mirror. You don't have a straight reflection back into this very small core. The tissue scatters quite a bit. And when it does, you, you lose the phase, but also you lose the directionality. And so very little light comes back into the core. In addition, since we are using a laser, what we observe is speckle noise. Because our laser is coherent, if we only select through this very small pinhole, the core of the fiber, the light that is um, coherent, we are gonna get interference noise that makes the image very tricky to observe. So if you look on, on the top, uh, you will see the kind of medical imaging that we do with optical fibers. With the single mode optical fiber, we, get, we can get OCT images, so the new type of imaging that allows you to get imaging in depth, so you get sections of tissue. You can get a single fiber endoscopy as well, where you see the face of this figurine, and you can also get confocal microscopy. But on all three of the top images, what you notice is the speckle noise, right? The images are not smooth. And that's due to using a laser, but also a, a single mode fiber. So what we decided to ex explore was a new kind of fiber called a double cloud fiber. It's a fiber with two zones, two concentric zones. You have the core, shown in red here, bringing the laser light to your sample, and you have the inner cladding that collects those scattered photons that have somewhat lost their phase, and so they can scramble in phase and get a smoother image. So now if you implement the double cloud fiber uh, into your imaging system, that's the, 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 the row in the bottom, in your endoscopy and see in your endoscopy image you see the image is much smoother you get a much higher signal to noise ratio because you have a much higher collection efficiency and your confocal microscopy image is also smoother in oct what it allows you to do is collect 
spectroscopic information. All those photons that were lost in the core can now be collected by the inner cladding. And because you have so much more of them, you can analyze them with a spectrometer and then find some molecular information. So this is where, starting with this very simple idea of an endoscope being a new laser, a fiber optics, and some imaging head, we do the imaging with um, on, on biological tissue, notice the speckle, and go back to the drawing board and say, how can we make the fiber better? So this, is, this was essentially the conclusion at the end of my PhD. Conclusion is we need better fiber couplers and we need dedicated fibers for imaging, not just to carry signal under oceans for telecom, but new uh, fibers for imaging. So this is where I joined Polytechnique, and, and then I, I moved to Polytechnique because of laboratory. There was a, for 25 years then, there was a laboratory called the Optical Fiber Lab, and they were experts at making fiber couplers. So the, those are fiber arrangements that allow essentially communicating with different areas of the fiber very selectively and, and very efficiently. And as I said, this is not an easy task because the fiber optic, the core is essentially the size, not the core, but the fiber optics is the size of my hair. And if these, this has three different areas, so the core is nine micron and the inner cladding is 100 micron and the outer cladding is 125, how do you only talk to the core or the inner cladding without talking to the other uh, sections? And this is the specialty of Laboratoire des Fibres Optiques. So we came up with a coupler that allows us to go from in schematic in A, from port one to port two in red. So that's the laser delivery path losslessly. So there is no loss in your fiber delivery. Now, if you have some of those um, very ballistic photons who are coming back from port two, those are very precious and you can collect them. They move from port two in the core to port one losslessly. So you still collect those very high um, information, but low throughput photons. So you, you have them. But all the photons that are backscattered from the tissue, they are collected in the inner cladding at port two, shown in white, and most of them will be redirected to port three. So by inserting this new device into a fiber optic endoscopic system, you can collect a hundred times more photons and they have different properties granted, but you can exploit the second channel that comes for free, the second channels, uh, and you can, if you know the properties of light, you can exploit them for different clinical applications. So this was our invention and we spent three years refining it. So you see several papers from 2010, 2013. Uh, this is how it's, it's done and I can tell you how it's made, but then I'd have to ensure you keep privacy. So let's not discuss this too much, but this is the uh, the the pooling, the diffusion tapering system in Professor Godbu's lab, where you see between the exactly in the center, the, the bright filament are the two fibers put together and where this is where the coupler is being made. And it allows us to do um, the same type of imaging, but we can we have still access to light from the core, which is great, but we can now have the light also from the inner cladding. So we're essentially adding an extra modality that exploit photons coming back from the tissue that are a hundred times more intense. And of course, I'd be happy to discuss for an hour this particular schematic. This is how we, we make the circuit. But I think the important point for today is to show that all the, the, the black lines are fiber optics. And this is an entirely fiber-based system. So there's no uh, free space. This is robust. You can go to the clinics and back and you don't have misalignment. So before going to the clinics, we test in the lab. And we, we, we are chocolate lovers in the lab. So we have in Canada what's called, and in Europe, what's called a Kinder Surprise egg. So it's a chocolate egg with a toy in, inside. So that gives you essentially the dimension of the little toy that we have. This is Merlin. So with our previous system, we take an image of Merlin. You see its nose, its glasses, and its eyes. But again, you see how much a speckle 
uh, how intense the speckle noise is. And for you, it's easy to see that it's Merlin because you've seen Merlin, but if you're doing endoscopy, you're going blind and you don't know what you're, you're looking at. So the speckle noise is really disturbing. By changing the fiber, you get still the same illumination from the core. So your laser goes losslessly to your sample, but you can scramble the image coming back and you get a much smoother image and a much more intense image. The signal to noise is a hundred times greater. The photons in A are still available though. You collect these two channels, A and B, completely independently. And because A has speckle, it has some phase information. And if you remember your uh, sophomore year physics or even maybe some, some interferometry that you see in college in, in wave and optics, you know that from the phase you can reconstruct the depth. So now by just adding this coupler to a single fiber endoscopy system, we can get a speckle-free image, much more intense, but that is you can also recover the depth. So for example, if you were to image an ovary and there was a tumor, you would see a bump showing in red, you get the, 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 three, the, the, the third dimension for free using this, this new technique. Of course, my idea of, of translational imaging is not just to image um, Kinder Surprise toys, just to know which one there is before you eat the chocolate. The idea was to try it on biological systems, and this is where we tried it um, on a mouse embryo the image with a single fiber on the left and the image from, and I hope this video is showing, is showing on my screen. So I have, uh, I have hope that, that you guys see it as well, but you see how the, the, the signal to noise is much, it's much deeper. You have an attenuation, a speckle, and you, you can see the feature of the animal much better than by just changing the fiber optics. This particular video led to technology transfer of course, we're academics, so we thought, you know, the, the produce, uh, the, the product on the, the top left was totally fine for industry. And then our partner, Thor Labs, said, you know what, let's refine it a little bit before we put it in a catalog. So now we are we're producing here in Montreal re the, these, um, these uh, um, instruments. And, and depending on how much time we have at the end, I can tell you about the, the tech transfer as well. So in terms of applications, um, one one piece that was of interest because again that's that was my phd thesis was confocal microscopy and for for those of you who are not familiar with confocal microscopy the difference with white field and confocal microscopies is that you can acquire virtual sections so if you're looking at um, a xenop embryo seen in f with a white field endoscope uh, uh, microscope what you see is all the layers at once and so the light scattering doesn't allow to discriminate between section and so an organ that is buried in the middle even though it's a transparent embryo the organ that is buried um, in the middle the heart shown by the, the 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 red arrow is can't be seen and if you're imaging it with confocal microscopy you can get virtual slices and if your focal microscope is fast enough you can get those videos so these are actually red blood cells flowing through the artery um, uh, the artery loop uh, near the heart of the embryo. And, and for those of you who are familiar with the architecture of um, the artery loop, you, you see there's actually an aneurysm that was created in the lab by exposing the embryo and its mother to alcohol. So this is, this is a warning as if we didn't have enough warning not to drink during pregnancy. So we could actually see the stagnation of the blood vessels within the aneurysm and the flow of um, of blood through the heart. Um, this is being done on a tabletop system and the idea is to bring confocal microscopy to the clinics as well to translate it to outside of the lab and as opposed to using pinholes in the lab we're using fiber optics they act as a pinhole and that's what allow the sectioning to be done. So this is the schematic from Minsky's uh, patent, uh, of course, redrawn for 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 uh, the purpose of my textbook. But the idea here that by using pinholes, you can um, get rid of the the scattered events, and you can reconstruct um, photons from a plane and essentially make abstraction of everything that was below and after up to a certain depth. And people have shown that you can improve the size of the pinhole to increase the SNR. So 
if you're the, the image that is shown in red, this is image of the skin taken by Milan Rajadiaksha. Um, if you have a single mode fiber or very tight pinhole, you get low signal but ton and tons of speckle, and you can improve a little bit the smoothness of the image and the signal to noise by opening the pinhole. And in our world, that means opening the fiber a little bit. So what you see here, the cross sections on the right are cross sections of our fiber. So the red dot is the core and the red and blue is the inner, the, the, um, the dual cloud fiber. But it's very different from the, dual, the double cloud fiber that I shown you earlier. The first double cloud fibers that we worked with had a really, really uh, wide inner cladding. And so we had to go back to the drawing board to be able to make a coupler with um, this new geometry of fiber. And it looks like such an insignificant difference, but it, it was some people had postulated that you couldn't do it because you have such a big barrier of glass to go through. And so one of my students, Etienne de Montigny, thought of a very clever trick with, with the group to, um, so he exploited a trick where he pre-tapers the fiber to trap light from the inner cladding and to make a new coupler with this. Long story short, we now have a new coupler dedicated to confocal microscopy image. So th these are confocal microscopy of uh, muscle, skeletal muscle. On the left, the image for the single mode fiber. On the right, the image with the double clad fiber. And you can see in the fiber in the bottom, you can see the uh, in the striation of the, the multi-mode fiber. So we don't lose the resolution. Um, but and we also increase the signal to noise just by designing a new fiber specifically for confocal microscopy we also showed that we can collect fluorescence through the inner cladding and some collaborators of of us have used it to make a confocal microscope to uh, identify lesion in the oral mucosa again using this this new fiber dedicated to improving the signal for confocal images. And in other groups, so we work with collaborators around the world uh, through the lab and also through the company, and it allows us to spread the technology to different applications. This is an image of the fungus, and if you if you do it with our fiber, you can get both the fungus and the cross section, which is the OCT image. So let's let's talk about OCT for a moment because I've been mentioning it a few a few times. Um, I'm playing with this. In my book, I show a piece of art for every chapter, uh, and this one for OCT. OCT is used to acquire non-invasively cross-sectional images. Um, and so here, it was. it's used in art restoration to see where varnishes, uh, layers need to be uh, restored on, on paintings. Uh, it was done on a minor painting, but now OCT is being done on, in, at the Heist Museum on Rembrandt and on Vermeer. So how does OCT work? Essentially, it's a, it's a new name for a Michelson interferometer. So as opposed to have the standard Michelson interferometer that you've seen in CEGEP or, or in college, as opposed to use a free space beam splitter to send your beam into a reference and a, 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 a sample arm and a reference arm, we're actually gonna use a fiber optics beam splitter working exactly the same way. So from the laser, you split your signal in two. One that goes to a sample, let's let's say my finger for now, and one goes to a reference mirror. And by comparing lights going inside your finger and on the mirror, you can get interference and have sectioning, uh, virtual sectioning of, especially if it's my finger, I'm gonna insist that it's virtual sectioning of my finger. And so the images that you get are essentially different cell layers in depth up to one to two millimeters. And if I were to turn my finger around, uh, I would, uh, ideally a movie would be playing, there we go. So you, you actually see the ridges of my fingerprint uh, and you uh, the, the little corkscrew structures are uh, sweat glands going from the dermis through the epidermis and eventually out into the open. So this is OCT. And because we're, we're working with the face, OCT must, be used with a single mode fiber. But the problem is that very few photons contribute to the OCT signal. Everything else is lost by this gating or the this this sectioning. And those photons do carry information. You can you can use these photons to reconstruct some autofluorescence 
or even spectroscopy signal. And this is where our coupler again comes into play. And, and again, we're redesigning the coupler for every application. So in this coupler here, OC, the, the red line, the core is used for OCT. So OCT from one to two and two to one losslessly. That's the, the line that shows like 100% OCT signal in blue. But we can also now gather autofluorescence from the inner cladding at port two and collect it at port three. And we used to be very excited to have like 75% transmission, but we're now we're more around 80, 85. So we can collect a whole bunch of photons. And because the area is so much greater, you get up to a hundred times more signal in fluorescence. So this is what it allows you to do. You get an OCT image. So this was done in collaboration with a group of David Sampson and, and Robert McLaughlin then in Perth in Australia. So that was a good way to test whether or not we can ship our couplers and they would work through shipping. And I actually, we, we, we did two things. I shipped a coupler and I took one in my luggage. So we, we, we tried having the coupler shipped through regular um, delivery and also myself bringing a coupler. Um, so their group is doing OCT through a needle. So they essentially make a, a cylindrical phantom and then they poke a hole inside the phantom and their, their needle acquires OCT images um, at 90 degrees. And as you turn the needle, you can get cylindrical information. OCT was great to tell you that there were three channels in this phantom. And then with our fiber, we can tell that there's in addition some in the channels autofluorescence uh, a channel was just with water, one with high concentration, low concentration. Proof of principle in 2015. 2016, a group in BC Cancer Ag Agency worked with us to integrate our coupler to their OCT system within an, uh, an in vivo probe that was sent to um, the human airways, in vivo imaging showing the autofluorescence from the extracellular matrix. And so essentially we can once we acquire the OCT signal and we unfold and make a map, we can make a map of the blood vessels following um, that are that are adjacent essentially to the airways. And what this group is also showing is a disruption of the extracellular matrix from neoplasias and dysplasias. And so this could become a, a natural, this is autofluorescence. So there's nothing injected to the patient. The patient is also not genetically modified to fluoresce. It's, it's pure autofluorescence intrinsic to the human body. And that becomes a, could potentially become a marker for uh, cancerous lesions. And this is what uh, this group has shown here. And I uh, encourage you to, to, uh, to, to go read their paper. It's, it's really excellent research. Uh, back in Montreal, we're also uh, showing new applications for this coupler. Again, OCT, but this time we're, we ask ourselves, can we, in addition to have the depth information with OCT, show the color? Because most clinicians have been trained with the color their entire life, right? So with the different shades of red, they can tell inflammation, different shades of yellow and green, they can tell infection. So we started with a, a a plant in my office. The plant is now dead because we kept, you know, trying with different leaves. But essentially, we're doing OCT through the core and hyperspectral imaging that we can reconstruct whichever way we want. We decide to reconstruct it with color, and by combining the two, you get the high-resolution depth information from OCT, and you get the color information from the inner cladding. And we can reconstruct it with RGB, so true color, but we can reconstruct once we have the hyperspectral cube, whichever way we want. So for skin imaging, for example, we can, you know, look for inflammation just by the color, the, the wet color that the, the surgeon is used to seeing. But we can also use, use the uh, spectrum from oxygenated versus deoxygenated data and then provide a map that is, you know, that tells the oxygenation or tells... Uh, if there's other markers. So but by the hyperspectral imaging, we can reconstruct the image whichever way we want and superpose, superimpose this spectroscopic information to the OCT depth imaging showing here, very simple example where you see the, the epithelium being regenerated under the, the, the scab, but it, it can show anything really. And, and the very last segment that I would like to address I still have about 15 minutes, so th this is good, is not only doing diagnostics or imaging, but also see, can we do new uh, devices to help 
uh, the, the therapy during um, while doing the diagnostics. So this is again inspired by our clinical translation. So one of the the um, the great aspects of our lab is going to the clinics with OCT and learning from that. And this is the work of my my first student, Fuzi Ben Bouja, who's now instructor at Harvard. So we we're, we're doing this in collaboration with the Massachusetts Eye and Ear, where he's using OCT in laryngology to look at normal and pathological vocal folds. Uh, on the top, you have a normal vocal fold with the layered structure, the glandular appearance, the the normal and false vocal fold, and in the bottom, you have a cyst. And this is truly important here because OCT is the first technology to, to show you the cross-section of the cyst non-invasively. Here, and it was a really rare case that the cyst was also biopsied. Typically, you don't biopsy the vocal folds, except in really rare cases. But here, the cyst was biopsied, and it allows us to show that OCT and histology have a really, really great correlation. You see the different structure. You even see the... Um, the the membranes between the different cyst uh, structures so it, it's not to the level of confocal microscopy but it gives you a, a layer structure and have a very good idea the differentiation between normal and pathological it is great um, of course bringing color to the, that is is one avenue but another avenue is that what do you do once you um diagnose a pathology. And again, I want to stress the, important of OC, the importance of OCT. In A, you have the endoscopic vision of the vocal folds, and the arrow points at a bump. And the current way to diagnose is essentially to sort of touch it with, you know, a long device and try through mechanical properties, trying to assess, does that, is this as stiff as a nodule or a cyst? And you have no idea what kind of cyst or nodule or even tumor it is. And, and I'll show you some pathologies. I have a much more gross appearance that are pretty obvious, but for a simple cyst like this, is this a nodule, is this a cyst? How deep is it? It's very hard to tell just by touching it. OCT shows you uh, the type of cyst. Is it full? What is it filled with? Especially if we bring the spectroscopic data and also how deep is it? And how much of the lemon propria can you preserve? In other words, how much of the voice can you preserve by operating on it? So it can give you a, an, a prognosis for the um, the uh, the therapy. But more than that, there there are other lesions that are uh, even more aggressive than a cyst. And this this is the, the the papillomatosis. It's the result of a viral infection on the vocal folds. It's essentially a wart. So in, in my very um, uneducated engineering point of view, this is like a wart growing in the vocal folds very rapidly. And what happens is that it increases, increases, increases the thickness of the vocal folds, closing the lumen. Unfortunately, the lumen here is the airways. So if you let it grow, 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 you don't have any room to breathe. And this is as I know, as an engineer at least, very incompatible with life. So if you suffer from this terrible, terrible viral infection, you have recurring warts on your vocal folds closing your airways. And every several months, you have to go to get a surgery, get it removed so you can breathe again. And eventually, we're also trying to preserve your voice. But in terms of the, the Maslow pyramid of, you know, of human functions, breathing and then the voice so we're trying to to do both so what my student uh fuzi is doing with dr hardnick is trying to look at oct to um of course you don't need oct to diagnose the papillomatosis i think everyone notices that there's something wrong here so that's good but at least how deep is it and can we use oct during the treatment to assess the depth of the treatment and to stop the treatment once we reach critical areas and, and this is a, a great first step, right? So you, you go with your laser probe, you remove it, and then you go with your OCT probe and you try to image the same area because the field of view is very small. And then you remove it and you do laser again and you bring. And so this is not the ideal way to do it. And so you guys see where I'm, I'm, I'm going with this. We have we've flipped our coupler around as opposed to extract light to have more imaging. We want to send light in 
to be able to have OCT monitored laser ablation. And this cannot be done, this is not done in a snap. Uh, this, is, this is not just wishful thinking, though we're working on it, but we're working step by step. And if you look at the laser interaction with skin, it's think of the egg, like when you put an egg in the pan, first you have, it heats, then you have coagulation, right? Your egg white turns white, right? It was transparent and it coagulates and turns white. And eventually if you leave it there for too much, you get all the, the, the vapor out, so you have vaporization. And if you do it very quickly, you have carbonization. This is, so it turns black. So you have all these steps and we're trying to gauge this and we're also tr doing that, not, of course, carb uh, you know, carbonizing the coupler. So we need to come up with new fibers, new geometries, such that we can reach exactly the right, the right level of ablation without carbonizing and without going too deep and without also breaking the coupler. So we're, our first step that I gave to a second PhD student, Kathy Baudet, was to ask her, can you reach uh, coagulation? Not Nothing else, just coagulation. So she did the math, the modeling. Uh, she had a, a dynamic Monte Carlo because, as it turns out, as you're doing your laser treatment, you're also changing the optical property. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a simulation that dynamically changes in time as you apply the treatment. But she managed to show and to, to predict when she can reach coagulation. So she's done imaging here on the, the so she first created the coupler that did not exist uh, a priori and used uh, on, um, showed it on, excised um, pore sign esophagus. So in A, you have the OCT image showing the epithelium and then the the, uh, the, um, the parenchyma of the, uh, the esophagus. And then at the white arrow, she stops her image so that becomes an M mode and she's pulsing her laser to see when coagulation occurs. Um, depending on the energy of her laser, coagulation takes 30 seconds or can happen in as fast as, you know, 16 milliseconds. And coagulation is actually seen in OCT because as the tissue coagulates, it increases massively the scattering properties. So you see the white arrow where the coagulation spots occurred in the OCT image. And in D, you also see the coagulated spot turning white in individual. And so now we, she refined the coupler to be able to have single pulse coagulation. This is what you see here. So again, uh, porcine esophagus on the left and the visual aspects of the endoscopy on the right. And you see that, the, that she's essentially, we're following the laser trace on the OCT image that, pr that produces the coagulation. She also managed to have a dotted line to show that she can do single pulse coagulation. And with other students in my lab, what we're trying to do is have new types of fibers made of new materials to be able to up the energy, the single pulse energy to be able to achieve vaporization. But you actually see a little, let's see water drops here. Do you see with the, the plume, there's a little bit of um, evaporation, this vaporization that's being done. So we're, we're right at the, the cusp of being able to do that. But this, this is through new fibers, and, and we have a project supported by Transmedtech, supporting uh, Edith Ducharme, who's working on these new fibers here. So we're modeling the depth. We're, we're trying to um, not just go blindly and, and shoot at stuff with a laser, but to be able to have a an absolutely controlled uh, wound, depth of wound without uh, carbonization, just being able to ablate very cleanly. And this time we use speckle. It turns out that the speckle is an indicator of the heat wave. So at first as heat, so the laser heats the tissue, it creates a Brownian motion that will uh, make the speckle move in your image. But eventually as the tissue coagulates, speckle, the, the scatterers become fixed, they're, they're stuck in time, and so the speckle doesn't move anymore. And so if you look at this video, what you see is actually the speckle, so the, 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 the heat wave propagating down, speckle moving, and eventually it stops moving, and this is the depth uh, at which you've reached coagulation. Um, Raphael and Kathy are, are working on this. Kathy is, is, is done now, she's, uh, she's actually managing Castor, and Raphael uh, finished his master's in collaboration with 
uh, Professor Uribe Pataroyu at Harvard Med, but the idea was to show that we can model the depth, we can um, essentially predict the depth and have the computer through the speckle analysis stop at the appropriate depth. Um, I have three minutes going and I, I thought I would give you for, for a flavor of entrepreneurship if, if you allow me to do it in, in the last three minutes. We, um, so in 2013, so I'm an academic through and through. I've never had a job other than being at a university or a hospital. So I was always in the lab, never had any entrepreneurship uh, desires or ambitions. But in this case, the technology, once you have something that improves the signal to noise by a factor 100, you have a moral obligation to send it out and our goal was to say let this technology be available to as many groups as possible and we spent a year with Univalor now Axelis trying to figure out the best strategy to have the product to the market as fast as possible we wanted to license or and eventually it turned out that the market was still to be explored and the companies who had the know-how very few companies know how to make these products and for them, because they were used to telecom numbers and volumes, the product was too, a little too niche for them. And so inspired by great, great entrepreneurs who also decided to uh, have money following their speech, a great entrepreneur said, we'll start this company with you. Uh, and it started as a company, uh, dedicated fiber optics couplers for biomedical applications. And for once, as opposed to just talk, 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 I also we also took a moment to listen. And the market tells us, wow, this coupler can be used for biomed, yes, but also for LIDAR, also for agronomy, also for all sorts of markets. And, and so um, this is how Castor was funded, but also Castor evolved uh, over the last eight years, funded by, uh, founded by Normand Bray, founded and funded by Normand Bray, a serial entrepreneur in Montreal, and Alex Cable, the founder and sole owner of Power Labs, and uh, founded with my colleague Nicolas Godbout and myself, and uh, also Univalor. So Polytechnique has essentially uh, equity in this company. We're strategic partners of Thor Labs, which means that they essentially were babysat us through the early stages. We can focus, could focus on the technology, and they would take care of. Um, distribution, uh, invoicing, packaging, sending, shipping. So it allowed us to uh, just focus on technology and also both of us, we kept our job as a faculty and still have a research group at the Cold Polytechnique. So now we make double cloud fiber couplers, multi-mode circulators, photonics lanterns. We have all sorts of products. So we are, we're branched out based on the market. So we launched at Photonics West 2014. We didn't have a product, which we had a demo, and we were just saying, hey guys, we have this new technology, tell us what it's good for. And the next year we launched a product, so it looked very good. It went through all the approval of Thor Labs. It's, it was on their catalog. And if you look at the date, less than a year later, it was shown at the same conference as having been used in vivo, in humans, uh, detecting a pathology. Uh, a few years later, we moved from the incubator at Polytechnique to a lab manufacturer at Ville Saint Laurent. This is our first employee now, directors of uh, director of operations. We had we kept partnerships with different labs, different companies to help them uh, integrate uh, our products into their uh, solutions and their imaging technologies. We keep well before COVID, we kept going to trade shows. This is Nicola, myself, and Alex Cable. The the one of the the two entrepreneurs who are who, who are mentoring us and we have new products so we're building it the russian doll way where we have a coupler we're putting it in subsystem and then we kept growing the company uh adding layers on top of the couplers so um yes this is an overview of what we do in the lab what we do at castor and with that, uh, I'd like with these side projects, uh, the textbooks, and uh, that my son, who's been very quiet, so I think he needs a hand of applause. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and for this very kind invitation to this e-seminar series. Well, thank you very much, uh, 
uh, uh, Professor Boudou for your very nice uh, and very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it uh, took me back to some of the work that we used to do in, um, at Harvard Medical School on whispering gallery mode uh, uh, biosensors. Uh, it was a long time ago, but uh, uh, and I, I was learning back then how these couplers work, and I uh, to be honest, I have to confess, it's very difficult. The physics behind it is for me is is beyond my uh, knowledge and uh, uh, <laughs> capability. But but uh, anyways, it's it's very very interesting. Uh, so and you can see that uh, like the uh, even the audience are very very interested in in your talk. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from the. Uh, can I can I stop sharing the, uh, my screen so I can see you because sure, I'm totally sure, you can there. you can. Please, please, oh, you, so you can. So, although I, I would love to see <laughs> your son's face, he is very cute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He will, he will come if I unlock the door. He will, he will zoom back in. I know, uh, I know. I have a three years old daughter, and then she never lets me uh, give a talk. So I usually hide in in, in, in one of the rooms, and, and so it's a. Uh, 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 so we have uh, questions, a few questions from the from the audience. I have uh, a number of questions as well, if time allows. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll start with with uh, uh, Mike Callas uh, from from University of Calgary. Uh, uh, he is uh, asking about the field of view at the end of the fibers. Would also uh, he's also uh, interested in the time it takes to uh, acquire data. Alors, uh, thankfully, the field of view is is not to do the fiber, but the, the scanning mechanism you employ. So typically, um, if you're doing confocal microscopy, half a millimeter field of view is feasible, right? So half a millimeter by half a millimeter, that's, that's great for a confocal microscopy, and that's doable with spectrally encoded endoscopy. For OCT, the problem is, is different. So you, you, you have your fiber optics, and then you have your interference line called the A-line, 90, 90 degrees um, with, with respect to your fiber. Mm -hmm. As you rotate your fiber, you acquire full circle. And as you pull your fiber, you get your 3D. So if you, so the only depth that, the only dimension that is limited by physics is the depth, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. not the working distance, because you can have the working distance being like three centimeters away and only imaging, but the physics tells you, you won't be able to image more than one to two millimeters. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially your field of view, but you can have your field of view close to the axis or mm -hmm. far away from the axis, depending on how you design mm -hmm. your, your, um, your working distance. And now if you, you can have that and you can decide to pull for 30 centimeters and do the entire esophagus in a matter of minutes. What's mm -hmm. the um, what's the speed of acquisition? Um, confocal microscopy, depending on your SNR, let's say 30 frames per second. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. good. Uh, for OCT, it's a matter of how many A lines you get per second. So I was mentioning that with our laser, we do 100,000 A lines per second, but there are groups pushing, and especially in Austria, groups pushing this repetition rate, and it's not commercial yet, but to a million A lines per second. So now it's a question of Nyquist, right? So depending on your diameter, how many A lines you need to put next to one another to fulfill the Nyquist criteria, criterion, and, and then pulling back. But with a million A lines per second, you can go pretty fast. I see, I see. Mike, I hope you uh, 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 your uh, you got your uh, received the answer that you, you wanted, but I, I think Mike, uh, if you are still there, uh, I was thinking about using this technology for imaging the uh, you know the spheroids or the the organs that you are making. Uh, so that's a follow up question that I had actually is that can this technology be integrated in existing uh, live imaging uh, technologies? Uh, for for imaging, uh, maybe maybe spheroids, tumor spheroids, or uh, stem cell organoids, and things like this, uh, in terms of monitoring their growth, uh, uh, or uh, you know, investigating the effect of drugs on the on these tumor spheroids, cancer spheroids, or, or uh, stem cells uh, mm -hmm. in situ, and then maybe use them for drug discovery and drug screening. 
That, that would be fantastic to do it, um, especially now that we have the spectroscopic capability. Mm -hmm. um, again, if your sphere is less than two millimeters, I think you would see through, so that would be great. Um, but the imaging head, so the, the, uh, the, the system is expensive, but the imaging head is not. Yeah. So let's think of a system that has, for example, OCT going this way, OCT going this way, and let's have a third axis. And now, as opposed to have three different OCT, you make an optical switch between the two and you say A line, A line, A line, A line, A line, A line, and you get your system. So you can make a, a tomographic system. Um, so, but I would, I would say that this is a beautiful, beautiful um, PhD in engineering. Uh, it's a great topic for a PhD student through Transmed Tech or other means. Yeah. Mike is even thinking about having an array on a dish. So uh, Mike is doing a lot of work. And then he was one of our uh, previous speakers. And then he gave a talk on stem cell uh, manufacturing. And I think he will be very interested in, in using this technology, especially in the format of uh, array to, to analyze their uh, their um, uh, 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 spheroids uh, aggregates they, they call them and yeah. then we are also working on two more spheroids and then there is a lot of potential here I can see that that this technology can be used for for two more spheroids um, analysis uh, for drugs screening <laughs> yeah yeah sure uh, I mean yeah. Mike wants to talk to you me too so Fantastic. Maybe. yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe whom and Mike myself we can we can chat separately offline and then come up with a very nice and interesting project i'm very interested in this technology uh so the next question is from chris flores from our university uh so chris uh, he is he's very good in in mems i know him in person he's our industrial liaison so he is a thank you for the excellent presentation he was wondering if you can also comment on the application of these couplers in gas detection and i know why he is asking that for for applications in maybe co2 capturing co2 sensing and then other applications mm. so yes yes and yes uh i don't know if it's a secret in our lab but i think through transmit tech because it's a funded project you you guys would know that so currently our couplers are limited at 1700 nanometers mm -hmm. our whole grail in terms of therapy is to bring it to two microns and three microns that requires rethinking. It's not even redrawing the fiber. It's a, it's a new type of fiber material, and it's a new type of fiber optics. Um, it, it's, it's a new school of design, and that's what we're working right now. We have a student funded through Transmit Tech who's doing beautifully, beautiful results. So, so I'm saying yes to CO2, uh, but at longer wavelength. And mm -hmm. so very soon i should you know if you invited me next year i would have great results <laughs> on bringing this to two microns and three microns what i have to put to you chris i think i think that's why you asked this i don't know if i was right correct me if i'm wrong if you're still on the on the call but i think i have i i should put you in touch with some of my colleagues here who are doing co2 capturing and co2 sensing uh for carbon management and then these kinds of applications uh mm -hmm. for energy so this is this is very interesting. So so this is where I have to separate my brain. I'm, I'm giving an academic talk today, and, and so the, the great relationship with Castor is that we're not just a startup, you know, in Montreal, and we have access to the world because we're in Thor Labs catalog. I don't know if you guys know Thor Labs, but it's it's a yep. it's a pretty big deal, right? It is. And, and and thanks to them, we have you know those famous customer inspired products. We yeah. have, so I have to, to, to watch out because uh, that's why I had to scratch biomedical uh, applications when I talked about Castor because day one, the biomed was our primary market, but in, in three years, it's mm -hmm. not going to be, yeah, it's, ex mm -hmm. it's super exciting too. And also from a personal point of view, having an impact through biomed is fun. Having an impact through biomed and environmental science, that's awesome yeah yeah it is it is indeed and then in terms of biomed i have a follow-up uh, question for you uh and that's about the uh, so when you enter into the biomedical engineering field and then like you know clinical applications of these kinds of technologies you always think about the safety issues and the risks yeah. associated with these kinds of technologies so so let's say that you want to obtain um, 
FDA or Health Canada approval for this technology, right? But eventually, yeah. what I envision is that these these sensors or these imaging uh, devices are going to be uh, implanted in the body, not implanted, but they're going to be uh, inserted into the body to image like tissues and organs in the body. So, so what are what are the challenges that you see um, in terms of safety so, of these technologies? The the um, so I sort of cheat the system a little bit because the vocal folds is not quite endoscopic. It's it's you know the vocal folds. I wouldn't call it an external or organ, but it's you know as close as you get. Yeah. And I can en encapsulate my fiber in, in thick enough of a material such that I know nothing will break. But yeah. you, you always have to make this demonstration of the failure modes, what happens yeah. if. And so, yeah. so uh, we can glue essentially everything in epoxy and, and have this demonstration that nothing bad can happen. But mm -hmm. I think the challenge is, is much harder when you go, for example, to do um, coronary artery through the fem femorals and you, you navigate yeah. through the bloodstream to get there. And a technique that was used by early OCT scientists that was, I thought was beautiful, is to take an, an existing system, an IVIS, for example, so um, intravenous ultrasound system, right? That's already going through the um, artery system to get to the mm -hmm. coronary artery. Mm -hmm. And what they did is that they took an IVIS and they stripped it out of its piezos and um, ultrasound system and the fiber optics is so small that then they put the OCT system in it. So you leverage from people who've done it before you, essentially. Yeah. And and that yeah. was a and so that shows you know that's your your first uh, entry to this yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually you answered uh, my next question, like partially, is 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 that whether this technology can be integrated into existing catheter systems technologies yeah. and then Absolutely. okay so. That, yeah. So this so is this typically is, what we uh, do also is to so for a big endoscope you have an instrument port you all you know to uh, to to um, oh I, I lose the word um, in English um, to to go grab it to do a biopsy essentially so you have an instrument port so when with yeah. your endoscope when you find a, an area that is yeah. suspicious then through the instrument port you you bring some forceps and, and grab a piece of tissue yeah. Um, yeah. and so uh, you can use the instrument port to slide your OCT slash confocal endoscope, and that's this is how you again leverage from the mm -hmm. the mechanical the navigation from those mm -hmm. um, yeah existing systems. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very smart actually. I mean, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, and then so that's very and then it makes your life much easier in terms of obtaining the the approval from uh, from from the FDA or Health Canada because and you rely. Some but, people have hacked the, those. So sometimes the instrument port is too small to to mm -hmm. slide it in and out. So they mm -hmm. essentially build their uh, so the, the the confocal system is a little slightly protruded protruding. Mm -hmm. It's just by a few millimeters, but the, the mm -hmm. lens needs to be a bigger diameter. So they hacked it and they permanently uh, exploited yeah. the instrument port. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. That's that's very interesting. And then again, I mean, I had another question uh, before about you know the the ability of using uh, I mean I mean this technology for treating patients. But you already answered that question as well nicely with with the laser ablation. Uh, that basically, and, and uh, that was my um, I wrote my uh, faculty application almost overnight because I saw it by chance. The deadline was the next day, and I'm like, oh, so I wrote it overnight and and. And as I was writing it, I wrote this line that I said, I wish one day you can, you know, after first visits, after your endoscopy, you can tell your patient you had cancer, cancer. not mm -hmm. you're having cancer. And then, you know, we're going to make a course of action in six months. But first yeah. visit, you go in and you said, you say you had cancer. That was a line that probably got me the, the faculty position yeah. uh, in engineering physics. Yeah. We're not there yet, but yeah. clearly this this is where or this is where I'm heading. But yeah. there are no shortcuts. And so this is where being an engineer is is and surrounded by doctors. So you always want to be talking to doctors all the time, but here surround yourself with material scientists uh, with experts in fiber optics. So I found Nicola Godbout and, and just listen to the new technologies, MEMS people, uh, just mm -hmm. to, to be able to enable that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, 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 the, the other question, uh, Mike has another question, which was my question too. 
and then his uh, he's asking about the effect of movement like on, mm. on, on, on the images so we're dealing with organs that are moving in the body blood flow person breathing etc uh, what, are, what are these effects on the on the measurements on the image so, uh, yes and no uh, mm. in OCT at a million a line per second you're covered Right, this mm -hmm. is fast enough that you're going to be faster than mm -hmm. motion typically. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. problem is, is with our spectroscopic data. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, um, even if we have a hundred times more signal, spectroscopy is has really really weak SNR. Mm -hmm. So this is where the work of my other student Xavier Tendu is, is so important. So he said, okay, in the lab we're going to do hyperspectral imaging. We're going to get all the wavelengths. And we're just going to learn everything we can from that system. But hyperspectral imaging, generating mm -hmm. so much data, processing it, the, the spectrometer required for mm -hmm. that, I was, I'm not going to call it impossible, but it's, it's going to be impractical because it slows down your OCT. Your OCT can never catch up with it. So what Xavier is doing, and I didn't have time to present, is to say, okay, so we in the lab, we have the hyperspectral system. Let's mm -hmm. find which three, four, five bands that we need. And then we're going to make a multi-spectral system that is mm -hmm. super fast. So mm -hmm. what he does is he, as opposed to have a white laser, he sends a laser with five colors that he modulates in frequency mm -hmm. and does a simple mm -hmm. Fourier transform. So now his multi-spectral image is as fast as OCT. And mm -hmm. that's really awesome. But you need to have the hyperspectral system in the lab to work work out everything you can from the tissue you mm -hmm. select the required band for your application are you looking for oxygen map are you looking for color what are you looking mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. customize this and so this is i guess a message for everyone mm -hmm. there is not it's not a one fits all approach mm -hmm. you and and this is why i love working with castor so much is because we didn't say we're going to work on this one organ and make a full instrument we mm -hmm. are having enabling technology and we say, let's find the best people in the world to do lungs, to do eyes, to do cardiac, to do, mm -hmm. and now the, the, but I don't have to be the expert in everything. I'm, I'm much yeah. happier to do head and neck. And even I, arguably I'm only doing neck. Mm -hmm. uh, Frédéric Leblanc is doing a fantastic job at the brain. So I'm <laughs> staying with thyroid, parathyroids and vocal folds. But, the technology assists and enables people to do all sorts of fun stuff, gastro, cardio, brain, and so on, neuro, and so on. That's great. And we have many people from different backgrounds here on the call as well who are who might be very interested to, to work with you on, on this uh, interesting uh, technology. Human is one of them, I'm sure. Uh, and then, um, so Human, do you have any questions to, to, to ask? Um, I don't have question, but I really enjoyed and I was learning. And I just want to also go back to my PhD when Caroline was the chair of my committee, Frida committee. And, you know, she gave me lots of homework to read That's about right. confocal microscopy and all the, the modalities and the stuff. So from that time, I really learned a lot uh, about the physics behind the imaging and you know how and i'm now asking my students to do that because they go to the uh, you know microscopy facility here but if they don't know the behind the scene they can't really choose the right objective and the the, the right you know modality and the, you know all these stuff the fluorophore so that was really helpful Th uh, thank you caroline and uh, no, I learned a lot, and uh, you know, maybe uh, we can talk offline about some Absolutely. kind of collaborations uh, on, on cardiac, on cells, and on tissues. Uh, so, uh, Mohsen, and uh, if you have anything to add, Mohsen or Caroline, uh, you can uh, go ahead. Uh, I don't I have, have one more. I just want to thank. Question, you. Human, then, so because I wanted to give you this opportunity. You know that I ask uh, questions a lot, and and if you don't tell me to stop ask me to stop then i'll keep asking so this is very interesting and then caroline i i, I don't know if you've heard of these mini microscopes that people place in the uh in uh, in uh, incubators in cell incubators uh so these are like uh you know uh, like basically cameras that people like these these uh, uh 
uh, you know, uh, these small cameras, very low cost cameras that they place in the in the in the, in the incubator, and then they they use that for imaging the tissues and cells, and so on and so forth. So that's a, that's a very low cost kind of uh, technology, but uh, they do not have the the capability to do confocal. So do you see this uh, technology uh, being used as you know uh, being integrated into these low cost uh, mini microscopes yeah. for, for uh, so imaging? I think this is this is a great direction the field is going using holographic and lensless yeah. focal microscopy and yeah. I think the pioneer in this is at UCLA Ido Anoskan he's yeah. doing like just great great so we were um, we're in the same lab during yeah. his postdoc and my PhD, but it's it's always the same crowd who gravitates. <laughs> and so it's, it's really fantastic work in that end. So he's exploiting light um, a different way. So I'm I'm sort of killing the phase, and he's exploiting it. So, uh, but as long as that, this is why the, the, the physics is so great. Physics is your tool set. It's your palette of colors, right? And and you have the phase, you have the amplitude, you have the wavelength, you have the gating. So, and then, and then you exploit it whichever way you want. Um, you want. I decided to kill the phase and he's exploiting it, but both, again, there's no one fits all answer. You need to look at your application. And, and, and I think if it were for, for cell incubators, I would definitely go the lensless approach and get mm -hmm. the optical sectioning for confocal using yeah. Iron's um, technology. I see. Okay, good. Good. I'm I'm quite familiar with Idagon's technology, and um, I, I bet you are. <laughs> <laughs> he is working on this uh, also this uh, sensor arrays as well, which is very interesting to me. Yep. Uh, well, uh, uh, so uh, so uh, um, I think I already asked my questions. You answered many of my questions here during your talk, and that's a that a good talk is that uh, the presenter answers the question while uh, they're talking. Uh, giving their presentation so it's, it's very interesting so uh, I'd like to thank you uh, again for your uh, for accepting our invitation uh, uh, we uh, we were very delighted to have you uh, today with us I really enjoyed your talk and, and, and then it seems that many of the participants are also they have enjoyed your talk and then you stimulated us to think about uh, different technologies so we will be in touch with you I'm sure Michael We'll be in touch with you. So I think we should have a like you know uh, I think Human Michael, uh, you and myself we should have a separate meeting and then discuss because uh, I see a lot of enthusiasm here. So uh, 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 so uh, and if anyone else is interested, uh, uh, either contact uh, uh, Dr. Bodo directly or if we can put you in contact with her if you would like to collaborate with her team or her you know the company that she's running uh so uh human if you have anything you would like to add please uh, uh, i just want to ask uh, everybody to just uh you know follow up uh, follow us for the future uh next week uh, presentation with the professor amir sheikhi from penn state uh, he's working on soft uh, biomaterials and uh, thank you so much again for joining us and uh, looking forward to see you and take care of yourself during this time so and uh, have a great day. Take care. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Okay. Okay. And broadcast.